Good evening. As you see the topic before us tonight is, can you prove the Bible with the Bible? I think the way we might hear this question or have it come up is if you, you're having discussion about why you believe in God and you, then you go to the Bible and talk about that, but then someone's like, wait a second, well, you're using the Bible to talk about why you believe in the Bible, and you can't do that. They're like, that's kind of cheating. And I want us to look in a little bit to that and see, is there any reason to go to the Bible to prove why we believe in the Bible? Is that reasonable to do so? And I'd like to argue that it is, but first, I, I do think we do need to be careful about circular reasoning. Circular reasoning being, if someone asks, well, how do you know the Bible is from God? And we say, well, because it says so. And they're like, but, but how do you know that it's saying so is from God? And we say, well, because it says so. I think we can give better arguments to that. There are better arguments than that for why this is an inspired book. We're going to get into that. But the reason this is important, there's other religious books and other religions, and they'll claim to be from God too. The Quran, would, that's the claim that's from God, or the Book of Mormon. But do, are, they the book, are they from God just because they say they're from God? Or that someone wrote that down? And if we just think about this question, first of all, well, do we prove the Bible in the first place? And what would that mean? Is you're going to say you're going to prove the Bible? It's kind of, there's a lot in that question. I want to break it down a little bit. One, you can't do a scientific test for the divine inspiration. You can't hold up this little device, and when you get to a book or a Bible, it just starts going beep, 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 and you know, oh, that's inspired, right? We can't do that. And you can't just work out this math formula and it's like, oh, that proves because you know, X equals Y and this, that, that means it's inspired, right? So how are you going to discuss anything about this in the first place? We just have to observe what's there in the text and make an argument about it and see, is there anything extraordinary about this that sets it apart from other things? If that's the case, then, hey, we should pay more attention to what's here. And if there is divine evidence, I would argue in the first place, we didn't really prove anything. We're going to be looking at some prophecies tonight and if we're talking about God giving knowledge about what would happen in the future, that's not something you and I prove. We can observe it and note it and be impressed by it and say, well, these writers, they can't know this stuff unless God gives them that knowledge. But well, we didn't prove that, did we? There is a sense prove can mean like you're reasoning out and explaining things. I understand that. But when people ask these questions, you just need to sort of define your terms. Like, What are your expectations for proving the Bible? What would that look like? So we're going to be looking at some prophets. And then as we look at these prophecies, we're going to ask, do you think it's more reasonable to believe that this person just had a lucky guess or that this is an inspired writing? First, to talk about the Bible a little bit. Well, the Bible, it's not just one book. Yes, you can hold up a, one book in your hand, but that doesn't mean that the whole Bible is like just one book. When Jesus had a Bible study in his day, he went to the synagogue. Luke 4 talks about this. He asked someone to bring him the scroll of Isaiah. And he's like, let's see what Isaiah says. And he finds his place. And he's going to quote, here's what Isaiah said. And this has been fulfilled in your hearing, right? You could find individual writers say, what did Isaiah say? What did Jeremiah say? And also, Jesus, after he appears and speaks to the disciple, he said, all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, they had to be fulfilled. He's talking about these different sections of Scripture. And really, you could say, well, what did Moses write about? Do you believe that? What did the prophets write about? Do you believe that? What did, what did the people who wrote the Psalms, David, the sons of Korah, Asaph, do you believe what that? You know, so it's a little different to say this is just one book. Or we might, we might be doing a little bit of a disservice by just saying it's one book. We really have a collection of all these different books. And these writers are separated by time. It's one thing for one person to just cobble something together real quick and then publish it out. But for all these people across time to work together and to be talking about a central theme is very impressive. You've got Moses who, around 1500, 1400 BC, these dates are just very general dates. And when you remember Moses lived 120 years, and then you want to say, well, exactly when did he write these books? I'm just giving you some general dates up here. So if you find something different, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised. But we're going to be looking at his writings, um, David, Isaiah, Daniel. And if you just look at the time span there, we're, we're around 1,500 years that all this stuff was being created. 
Now, you think you could get 1,500 years of people to collaborate on something that wasn't true, like the ultimate hoax? We're going to get into that. I don't think it, it's going to be a lot harder than you would make it out to be. These people were also separated by occupation. Moses was born in a royal family in Egypt. That's where he grew up in, at least. But he left that at the age of 40, then he becomes a shepherd. Then he takes over, as God calls him out of that, to be a leader of Israel. What about David? Well, he was a shepherd too, but he was also a musician. And he was a warrior and a king. Isaiah, all I got is that he was a prophet. So I just put a question mark up there. For Daniel, he was brought into Babylon to become a king's servant along with others. And then he ended up becoming an advisor to the king. Then you get in the New Testament and you have men that are tax collectors, physicians, fishermen like John and Peter, Paul's a Pharisee. These people come from a lot of diverse backgrounds. You know, some religions in their text, it's like, here's all of our trained scribes or here's our special religious men. And this is all what they say. But when you have the Bible, God's, God pulls people from all different kinds of walks of life. And it's very impressive that he used all these different people with different vocabularies, different educational levels, and even some different cultural backgrounds occasionally to communicate his will. That being said, let's go ahead and start with Moses. I invite you, please follow along. Look at these passages with me. I'm going to start in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we're going to be using the timeline a little bit. Think about when they say things and what, when these things come to be. And then how can you make such claims? Put into context, Moses is the leader of Israel. He's, Israel is about to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy is a book. It's like his last sermon to get them ready, a little bit of a farewell. Imagine if you're the leader of a nation and you tell them this. Let's look in verse 1 of Deuteronomy 30. So it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind, and all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today. The Lord will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples at the end of the earth. From there, the Lord will bring you back. And you could just look at this and say, well, what kind of leader for a nation before they even get in their promised land is going to tell them, you're going to mess up. God's going to bring all these curses on you and you're going to go into captivity. But don't worry, once you're in captivity, and you repent, God's going to bring you back out of captivity, and he's going to bring you back here. Well, again, Moses, he's around 1400 BC when he's writing. But captivity, you get towards the time of Daniel, closer to 600 BC, when Babylon starts taking over. This, Moses is talking about something that's going to happen 800 years later, and he speaks about it with confidence. Before this nation really gets into his land and gets established, he's like, y'all are going to captivity, and then God is going to bring you back from that, which gets more at about 530. Um, so it's impressive. How could he know this was going to happen? If you were a leader of a nation, why would you say something like that? Does it make sense that Moses would just make something like this up? It doesn't to me. So for him to be able to say this, I think this is just a little, a little crumb dropped with it. Hey, he knew some stuff that he shouldn't have known. A regular guy wouldn't have known. Patrick read this for us in Psalm 22. I'll invite you to turn there. We'll, we'll take a peek at a few verses. Maybe put a bookmark there. I want to draw some comparisons from some of the Gospels. And again, we're talking about David living around 1000 BC now. And we're not going to read the whole Psalm. We're just going to pull out a few verses here and there. But first of all, one thing you should have noticed when he talks about in verse 16... He says, a dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil doers encompass me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Well, David is describing crucifixion. What's so impressive about that? Crucifixion didn't exist in David's time. Crucifixion is something the Persians did about 500 years later. And now, to be clear, people were being hung up or attached to things in various ways in David's time, but as far as an execution method, put a live person, you know, and pierce them through, 
to attach them to a tree. That wasn't something even happening. So for him to even know and describe an execution method didn't exist, it's kind of odd. But even besides that, if we go to the gospel accounts and just draw some comparisons between what's said here and then what's said in the gospels about what happened around Jesus' crucifixion, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. The language is so similar. So let's notice in verse 16 of Psalm 22. Well, I read that one. It mentions they pierced my hands and my feet, right? In Luke's gospel, Luke does appear to the disciples, and in verse 38 of Luke 24, he asks them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that is myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And says they, he showed them his hands and feet. That was one of the things that was mentioned in the psalm, and that was one of the things that they saw in the crucifixion, and it's interesting to see that's the same thing that happened with Jesus. Again, in um, Psalm 22, verse 8, this was brought up. This insult, this accusation, let him save him, let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Now, when we go to Matthew's gospel, this same kind of language is used about Jesus. Matthew 27, in verse, I'm going to start in verse 42. So the chief priests and the scribes and elders, they're going to mock Jesus and listen to what they say. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I'm the son of God. They didn't really realize what they were doing, but they were, they were fulfilling what was written in Psalm 22. That same kind of insulting language to say, well, if you're suffering because God... God doesn't like you, and you're being punished. And if God really liked you, he would save you from this suffering. They're making that same kind of accusation against Jesus. You said you're the son of God. Well, if, God, if you're, God's your father, he would save you from this cross. They were doing that exact same pattern that David spoke about a thousand years prior. And also in Psalm 22, in verse 18, it mentioned, they divide my garments among them, and they cast lots for my clothing. Again, David wasn't writing this all about himself. David didn't die of crucifixion. He's just writing about some future event. But in John's gospel, it even connects and quotes this psalm. In John 19, verse 24, they said to one another, talking about the guards that were there, well, let's not tear Jesus' garment. Let's cast lots for it to decide who it's going to be. And it says this happened so that scripture will be fulfilled. Now, I know, a, I know a skeptical person could look at this and say, well, Matthew just tried to make make this fit what he read. You know, he's just trying to fill in the details himself. But the thing is, you know, Matthew can't make up the crucifixion, right? David couldn't just invent that. And Matthew couldn't invent the kinds of insults that the religious elite were hurling at Jesus. He couldn't invent the way that the guards, the Roman guards were roughly treating and handling prisoners. That's just stuff that was already existed, right? And if, if he did invent that, then his, their accounts would have been laughed away as fiction, but they weren't. So again, if you ask, well, how could David know about these things so far ahead in advance? I think the most reasonable explanation is to say because he had divine knowledge, because God prophesied this or gave this knowledge ahead of time. Let's go to Isaiah now. Isaiah is living around 700 B.C., so we're, we're inching our way forward. And I put up another little chart to focus on the events we're going to talk about, just to focus on that. So first, let, turn with me to Isaiah 39. Isaiah 39. <clears throat> to give you some background while you're turning there, King Hezekiah in Judah, he had recently gotten really sick, and God told him, hey, you're about to die. You need to put your house in order. And he prayed. He was distraught about it. He prayed to God, hey, please. I think it, it doesn't say for certain, but he wanted to live. He didn't want to die. He got better. And Isaiah 39.1, guess who hears about it? Um, this king of Babylon, he sends letters and a present to Hezekiah because he heard, hey, you, you got better. I'm so happy for you. Hezekiah is really excited, and he invites him to come and see everything in his kingdom. 
And then Isaiah is like, hey, what did you just do? In verse 3, what did these men say? And Hezekiah explains everything. And I showed them everything in my house. Now look in verse 5 of Isaiah 39. Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left. And some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away. They'll become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you've spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and truth in my day. Hezekiah was just glad he wasn't going to be taken to Babylon. But notice Isaiah, he spoke about something around 702. That's based off the last 15 years of Hezekiah's life. But Babylon, their, their first wave of bringing people back in, that happens around 605 B.C. Isaiah's talking about something about 100 years later. He's saying this, this nation, this faraway nation, they're not an empire right now. That's Assyria. But they've got to come here and take everything away. Pretty interesting. How can he know that? Lucky guess, maybe? Well, let's keep going. What about after Babylon? Look with me in Isaiah chapter 13. Again, while you're turning there, if you think about the kingdoms of the world around that time, as Assyria was a big power, and then Babylon came up, and then you had the Persians and the Medes working together called the Medo-Persian Empire, and then you had Greece come after that, and then Rome. Well, so we're stepping from Babylon. Let's think about what's going to happen to Babylon. Isaiah 13, you can see it opens up, Oracle Concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Am- Amos saw. So whether that means he spoke directly to them or just spoke about them, he's like, here's what's going to happen to Babylon. Let's talk about it. And let's scroll down. <laughs> scroll down. You can tell I'm a tablet user. Look, look down in verse 17. He says, behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes, the Medes against them, who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. And verse 19, Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. He has his message of judgment. Babylon's not, they haven't taken over yet. But they're going to be overthrown. You know, he's, of, course, of course, Judah and Israel will be overthrown. Yeah, but Babylon, they're going to be overthrown too. And who does he name? The Medes. Well, the Medes, that's going to be around 539 B.C. And when we get to Daniel, Daniel lived in that time of the transition from the Babylon to the Medo-Persian Empire. He lived through that. But that's another 70-ish, 65-ish years later after Isaiah. So how, did, how could he name the people who's going to, not just the next kingdom, but the people who's going to take down that kingdom? You know, can you see how this is getting a little more involved? And it just, it's just going to keep getting crazier, so get ready. Let's look over in Isaiah chapter 44. In Isaiah 44, and I think this passage speaks really well to what we're talking about, the Lord, the maker of all things, starting in verse 24, he says, he stretches out the heavens by himself, spreads out the earth all alone. He causes the omens of boasters to fail. He makes fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness. Basically, people who want to make up their own prophecies and prediction, God makes a fool out of them. But what does he do in verse 26? He confirms the word of his servant, and performing the purpose of his messengers. It is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and will raise up her ruins again. Look at verse 28. It is I who says of Cyrus, he's my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and the temple, your foundation will be laid. So Cyrus, he's this king of the Medo-Persian Empire. Imagine... Remember the kingdom stack I was telling you about? If you guess the kingdom that's going to come and take you over, you guess the kingdom that's going to take them down. But 175 years later, you, get, you just guess the name of the guy who was ruling in that kingdom. What do you think the odds of that are? To get all three at one. You know, if, to name someone by name. I just think that's it's probably like Thomas Jefferson naming George Bush or something. You know, like you, you just don't get that lucky. That, how could Isaiah know something like that? 
And when you look at all these things, you just, the only explanation that seems reasonable to me is that they, were, they had divine knowledge. They were writing by God's inspiration. That's how you can say such things so confidently. Well, let's keep going. What about Daniel? Daniel, even though he lived in that around 600 BC, you know, he lived through the Babylonian Empire and into the Medo-Persian Empire, that transition, but he would have been an old man around that time, and it's possible he could have written around that transition time. But let's look at some of the things that Daniel noticed as well. Look with me. Flip, go ahead and flip over to Daniel chapter 8. While you're doing that, I'm just going to give you a little background. For some of the visions Daniel's seen thus far, in chapter 2 of Daniel, he, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream about a statue, and the statue was representing four kingdoms. He's the head, Babylon, but it doesn't say anything about the kingdom. It's just like there's going to be another kingdom after you, a third kingdom, a fourth kingdom. We get to chapter 8, and there's this other vision. This vision involves a ram and a goat. And you can see in verse 3 of Daniel 8, he says, I lifted up my eyes and looked. Behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. And the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other. And then look in verse 4. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, southward, and no other beast could stand before him. So here's this big angry ram, right? We got our first, we got our first part of the picture. Look at verse 5. While I was observing, behold, a male goat came from the west over the surface of the whole earth. Without touching the ground, the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes, and he came up to that ram and says he rushed at him in his mighty wrath. And basically, he takes down this other ram, this goat. And then it says this, this male goat, it magnified himself. Okay, now we're not going to get super deep in this, but let's just go down to the explanation. Look down with me in verse 20 now of Daniel 8. He, he gets the information, the ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. Okay, they're this big ram, and they were able to come in and conquer. It seemed like no one could stop them. But that goat that came in, verse 21, that represents the kingdom of Greece. And a large horn that's between his eyes is the first king. And you think, well, he's a really prominent figure that sort of led Greece. Seems to be Alexander the Great in his conquest. Um, but 330 is around the time that's happening. So 200 years later, again, how, how can you name off an empire after an empire? How would you know if Greece is going to come next to be the one to take down the, Medo, the Medo-Persian empire? It's pretty impressive. But we're not done yet. Look with me. It should be a pretty nearby. Chapter 9. We're going to peek at verse 24. Please read with me. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. All right, so he says 70 weeks to do all these things. Let's continue. Verse 25. So you're to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people, the prince who is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Uh, let's look at verse 27. He will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he's going to put to stop sacrifice and grain offerings. Just to stop there. We're not going to get into all of it, but some of this I do want to dive into. First, notice the Messiah's timing. He's talking about when the Messiah is going to come and what the Messiah is going to do. The number he gives us is 70 weeks. Now, your version, if you have a different one besides, well, what I'm reading, you may have 77s. That can also be translated that way. And the way that's been traditionally understood is that a seven, this week, is seven years. So we're talking about a unit of time, 77s. Now, if you don't feel like doing math, I put some math up there for you, but... He talks about seven weeks happening and then 62 weeks. So you get 69 weeks, right? 
And then, so the 69 weeks is talked about, and then there's this final week talked about. That's just to give you the background. But if you say, well, 69 weeks, 69 times seven, what do you get? 483. Are y'all hanging in there? I know numbers can be scary. They scare me too. Um, but, and there's that last week. It's, he talked about the first part of the week in verse 27. He's going to make a firm covenant with the many, but in the middle of the week, he's going to put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Okay, so there, there's our setup. We can go with this now. Well, are you ready to do some math? Well, Daniel, he has his vision around 539, just to, but that's just about when it happened. It says it's going to start from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, Artaxerxes, he permitted a building and restoration to continue in 457 B.C. Now, if, if someone, if you want to do, pull out a calculator and you want to see what you get, you, you can go ahead and do it. You can take 457 minus 483. But I'll, I'll give you, if you don't feel like doing that, I'll tell you. You're going to get 26. You're going to get to 26 A.D., and you're, you might say, well, that's not 27. You know, am I being gypped here? So 26 to 27, that time difference, it's like, you know, in one year, I can be 32 and 33 years old, right? Because of just a change of a few months. And it, it doesn't say exactly what month it is when these things happen. Basically, you hit the nail on the head. If, for him to say 483 years after, that's when the Messiah is going to happen. 27 is when Jesus started his ministry. He died in 30 AD. So now I'll put this back in perspective. If you're Daniel talking about here's when the Messiah is going to come, here's what he's going to do. Israel as a nation has existed um, at that point for 900 years. And if you want to tell me, well, I'm going to tell you when the most important person in history is going to come. Or... You, you can say Israel existed a thousand and plus years if you include Egypt. But let me tell you when our Messiah is going to come. If you were even remotely close, even in a hundred years, I would be really impressed. If you were maybe even ten years away, I think I'd be pretty impressed. But you basically hit the nail on the head. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Don't you think? For the timing of that. Now, that's for the 69 weeks, though. There's still that last week. And what's, so what's happening in that last week? Again, in Daniel 9, verse 27, it said he was going to make a firm covenant with the many for one week. When Jared did that Bible reading this morning, and he was talking about the blood, my blood which was shed for many. That really jumped out at me. It was shed for many. Like Jesus is fulfilling what he said he was going to do, making this covenant. And if you think about a week, the seven years, Jesus' ministry was about half of that, three and a half years. And in that next three and a half years, basically the start of the book of Acts, as the gospel goes out, Jesus, God is confirming his covenant. He's spreading it. So what else accomplished the seventh week? Well, finish the wrongdoing. That might mean that the Jews filled up their wrath by rejecting the Messiah. But making an end of guilt, Jesus finally, he finished the job, right? Or make an end of sin, excuse me. Jesus paid the price, so sin's the sin problem is dealt with, to make atonement for guilt. Now, our relationship with God has been restored. To seal up vision and prophecy, to say that Jesus is the last message to God. We're not going to keep giving a bunch of new visions about what's to come and everything. Like, Jesus is the final message. We've got to hear him now. We're going to seal and put the step of approval. And Jesus said, I came to fulfill all these things. And then, anoint the most holy place. When Jesus ascended into heaven, says he went into the holy of holies. He went to God's presence, and he prepared that for his high priestly ministry. He could do that on our behalf. I, I know we covered a lot of ground here, but when you just put that in your mind and say, well, again, how could Daniel speak about this? How could he know with the timing? This is more of a conversation, I think, for, for just, my hope is just to give you a few little things that can build your faith some, and then when you're talking with people, maybe this could be something you bring up hey, have you ever thought about that they wrote about something that was so far beyond them? You know, have you noticed this? Or what about this? Now, I would be a fool to act like I could tell you everything you need to know to prove everything in the Bible. I mean, I can't do all that, especially in one sermon like Rusty was saying this morning. But I just hope that some of these things could build your faith and say, 
this is really different than all the other religious religions and their religious texts out there. And I, I know because I was Googling, I was Googling hard, what are the best arguments for Islamic prophecies coming true? What are the best, the best proofs for the Book of Mormon? And they, there's just no comparison. They don't come close to being able to do stuff like this. Now, and I don't think any of you here, if you were Christians, became a Christian because of one of these things, right? I don't think so. I, I think our faith rests in something even stronger. And God says his strongest evidence is raising his son from the dead and offering him as a proof to the world. But all these writers, even besides the ones I mentioned, they were all pointing to Jesus. And Jesus said, these were all about me. And, I, and for, just for someone, maybe if you can get a foot in the door, if you can get them to say, well, hey, these aren't just a bunch of silly old books that someone threw together. These people knew some stuff. They had knowledge that you just can't explain as regular human knowledge. So I hope this will be something that's helpful for you, interesting for you. Um, if, you have, if you'd like to talk to me more, I'd be glad to. If you have any corrections, I'll hear that as well. But I hope that's something that will be beneficial for you. We serve a great and almighty God, and it's amazing that he communicated to us at all and loved us, but that he's revealed his great plan so that we can be saved. The best decision you can make is to obey the gospel. Uh, we have opportunity right now, water ready and warm, I think, that you can make your right, life right with God because Jesus paid it all. So if you have any kind of need, why don't you make it known while we stand and sing?